Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about this thing called the block complex. Uh, this is a, sort of a, a, a new way of building invariants of manifolds that's uh, closely related to, to topological quantum field theory. Uh, and the, the talk is sort of a, an advertisement for, for these ideas. I mean, we don't really have any fantastic applications it's kind of proving hard to compute. Uh, but all that said, I think that there's, there's probably something fun going on here. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it is, how you might go about computing it, and the sorts of things we have in mind for uh, one day proving things. Uh, so I'll tell you, there are two papers about it. Uh, a big one and uh, a little one. Uh, so the little one is totally This talk is easier than I did. Okay, so uh, where do we start? Oh, oh this is all um, joined with uh, Kevin Walker, who's at Microsoft and Santa Okay, so uh, it all starts with uh, what are topological quantum field theories. Uh, are sort of the, the nicest invariant in manifold in some sense. So I'll try and explain a bit about in what sense they're nice. But at the very least, what they should do, well, uh, we've got a space over dimension you're working in. So let's say an n plus 1. associates uh, with n manifold. Some vector space. I guess I usually write the uh, generic T to T as a letter A. And then to n plus one manifolds. And I want to think in terms of uh, some manifold that's maybe got boundaries, and maybe that boundary is split up into uh, incoming and outgoing parts. And I'm thinking this n plus one manifold is a cohortism between n manifolds. It associates with that uh, a linear manifold. So that's the sort of thing you always expect to see whenever someone says they've got a, a topological field to do. But there are quite a few more variations. Um, so something that's important for us uh, sometimes uh, not all n plus one manifold. We might have some restrictions about what sort of thing that we can do at the top level. And the case that I'm going to care about a lot of the time is uh, if, we, if, uh, if we only associate map, or if we only allow uh, uh, mapping zones at the top level, then we call this. Uh, n plus epsilon to be equal to zero. So it does everything that it's meant to do in uh, dimension n, but it only gives you uh, a very little piece of this data. So look, this is telling you the mapping class group is acting, say, on, on surfaces, but you can't just do arbitrary things in uh, arbitrary manifolds in this dimension. And most of what I'm going to be talking about is actually really only talking about n plus epsilon. 
Sorry, for So you can think about this as, as just giving you uh, vector spaces for any manifolds and maps that if you want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah, and then plus a fetch line which should be good for this case. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, so pick some diffeomorphism from uh, from one end dimensional manifold to another and uh, take the yeah, so th these are yeah, these are really not saying anything about most inverse functions. They just tell you how different morphisms act on these vector spaces associated. People also call these some of those inverse dimensional TQOs, TQOTs, or decapitated TQOTs, or uh, I've even heard topless TQO. Okay, so. Same manifold or different morphic manifolds in the same space. This is the same Oh, uh, so uh, say I've got some head from uh, sigma 1 to sigma t. Okay? I just want to take uh, sigma 1 from the side, and then I do the bottom boundary of this identically to sigma 1, and then I do the top boundary. There's two pieces of boundary crossing in between the axes. Did I use the wrong word? Mapping someone with the right thing. Yeah, I'm not thinking about that. Oh, sure, so I'm mapping someone. Yeah, that's right. I've got the two pieces. Okay. Now, the really nice sorts of TQFTs are ones that are called fully extended TQFTs. Also associate a whole lot of data to lower dimensional things. And in particular, they do that in a way that lets you compute by chopping up your map. So, uh, fully extended TQFT, which I say associates uh, n minus 1 manifolds uh, categories. Two manifolds, two categories, and so on all the way down. Zero manifolds, and now the point of all of this extra data that you get is that at each level. There's sort of a formula that tells you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, in addition to that stuff as well, it also tells you things associated with the Okay. Uh, some manifold of lower dimension here, the sigma. I can compute this as a sort of, uh, some sort of appropriate tensor product. Here is that say we're, we're in the top dimension here, and 
in these pictures of drawing an n-dimensional man, for instance, then uh, A is going to associate some vector space here, and some vector space here, and some category down here. And th this formula is saying, well, actually, this vector space has the structure of a representation of this category. Similarly, this vector space carries a representation of this category, and we can recover that vector space by just taking the usual algebraic tensor product of those two, of those two modules, identifying the action of the category on this side. I mean, there are suitable interpretations of this formula. I don't really want to say exactly what all the symbols mean in all the, the lower dimensions, but you compute the, the k categories in whatever co-dimension k you're working in over here as some sort of algebraic operation. You should think uh, uh, sort of translates gloomy. start to suspect looking at this sort of setup is that maybe actually uh, there's a sense in which everything is determined well maybe I haven't said it quite right in this case. But uh, well if you think about this sum <laughs> you, you, you might start to believe that everything here is actually determined by the data that you associate with zero manifolds. And maybe if you're just working with uh, with uh, unoriented zero un unoriented manifolds, there aren't many zero manifolds, it's just disjointedness of points. So maybe there's actually very little data that you need to specify to actually recover all of this. And the, the transportism hypothesis of, uh, well, a reasonably formulated vaguely Say is what this n category is associated to a point, and these axioms let you recover all of the other data of the, of the associated tissue. And so, uh, I mean, when these guys originally formulated it, it was really saying uh, one should be able to give definitions of both sides of this so that it becomes a theorem. This was sort of a, a way of characterizing good definitions, and, and Lurie eventually made all the definitions on both sides of precise enough. So you, you definitely, um, you def I mean, there's a lot to specify what this means over here, but you should certainly have in mind that you're going to be at the weak end of the spectrum of discrete um, Can you explain what the No, oh no, absolutely. Yeah, there, there, there are plenty that aren't in I mean, it makes sense only the top dimension of these manifolds. So uh, I began by saying the topological field theory is the nicest invariance, but I really should have waited a moment and preserved the nicest before we 
could be the, could be the very next piece of what we're saying. But there are quite a few examples. Okay, so what am I going to try and do today? Well, what I'm going to try and do today. in some amount of detail one particular way of filling in what exactly an n-category with dual is. I'm going to give you a very sort of topologically motivated definition of what an n-category with dual should be. And then I'm going to show you a very explicit construction that gives you a, a, a fully extended uh, TFT using that definition that I'll give you of an n-category. So obviously that, I mean, that's, a, that's not at all competing with Lou. I'm, I'm not showing you this, this equivalence. I'm just telling you some, some things that you can put over here that, that give you an arrow going to the left. But then what I'm going to point out is that there's a, the way we set things up, you can do a lot more. And the thing that you can do more, well, let me, let me catch up. This line in categories I'll tell you why they're a good way of thinking about in categories in this sort of context. Uh, <coughs> show how to construct. Steps long topological field theory from that, and then uh, we'll discover that there's a very natural way to see that these vector spaces associated to n manifolds coming from this construction uh, is actually the, uh, the zero homology. Zero homology of an actual chain complex associated to uh, the category that we're working with and the, the manifold. So really, somehow, all of these invariants that TQFTs give you, there's actually much more structure sitting there. Uh, a lot of the time previously, people have been thinking just about the zero homology of this chain complex, because all this higher data is what in these chain complexes. And this thing, this chain complex is the block complex. Okay. So, let me try and tell you what a disk like n category is. Paper. This goes on, this definition goes on for about 20 pages. But it's the essentials of compressive molecular form of two. So I'm just leaving a bunch of stuff out, but the, the, the good bits will appear. Okay. So what is it, first of all? It's a bunch of functors who write C subscript K, and each one of these goes from a category of K balls. So I'm going to uh, have to tell you about the morphisms too, and that's just homeomorphisms of k-balls. So this is just some little, some little groupoid where the objects are uh, things abstractly isomorphic to the standard k-ball, and uh, and the isomorphisms between them. And what do these functors do? Well, they just send you over this set. And you should think of this that. CK of X, some K ball, is uh, set of P morphisms. I'm telling you what an N category is. I better tell you zero morphisms and one morphisms and two morphisms and so on. Uh, so CK of X is the set of K morphisms 
of shape x. Now, the rest of this remark will only make any sense to people who've thought about other definitions of many categories. But if you've thought about other definitions of many categories, you'll recognize that every sort of definition somehow implicitly has in mind some particular shapes that morphisms should have. Perhaps the your morphisms should be sitting on rectangles, and the algebraic operations for composing morphisms correspond to sticking rectangles side by side in a bigger rectangle, on top of each other in a bigger rectangle. Or maybe some other definition uses, uses bygones instead of taking the rectangles and collapse the sides, and the algebraic operations can correspond to the ways to combine those. And we're taking a, a much more uh, ambivalent view. We're just saying, well, all shapes are going to be allowed. We don't care. As long as you've got some shape in mind, I'll tell you what the set of morphisms of that shape are. And somehow, this, thing, this, this here is somehow how we get the right level of weakness for people who know about strictly weak things. Okay. Let me show you the, the next axiom or two and you'll see how we're going to get this. Okay. We've got these functions which give us a set with k ball in k, or I should have said with k, um, you know, with three zero morphisms in k. Zero morphisms, one morphisms, all the way up. Okay. And you can have Say that I've got some k morphism of shape x, then I can extract from that p minus one morphism of shape y whenever y is a subball of the boundary of x. Okay. So I can I can take a morphism on a k ball and I can restrict it to the ball shape piece of the boundary. Now, you'll notice between these two things, uh, this means we're never saying that a morphism in any dimension has a source and target. It's just there's some set of morphisms on some shape, on some ball. But if you take a ball and you divide up its boundary into the incoming hemisphere and the outgoing hemisphere, then I can restrict to either of those and we can call those the source and target of the morphism. But I don't pre-declare that. You've got to pick your decomposition of the boundary between something either and target before it's The last bit of data we need are clues. So say uh, we have k morphism in some ball x1 and a k morphism in another ball x2. And what we'd like to do is produce a k morphism on x1 glued together with x2. I'm going to specify how we're gluing them. I'm going to glue together along some k minus one ball y. Okay, so should just think of there's y on my boundary, there's x1, there's x2. Uh, so that the whole glue glued together thing is still shaped like a ball. Well, I can do that. I can take a morphism here and a morphism there. But I can only do it on this 5 of 12. If I have a morphism here that restricts to something on y, and another morphism here that restricts to the same thing on y, then I'm allowed to do them again. I can say put a, a big morphism on the big morphism. Okay? And uh, I haven't thought at all about higher categories, which I know most people haven't, um, but uh, you maybe vaguely have the idea that in n category there should be n different directions in which you can glue together, you can compose morphisms. That just corresponds to there sort of being n different directions. But again, here we don't have the directions pre specified, just any way of sticking them together. Okay. So that's essentially all of the data, except for a bunch of minor ambiguities that occupy a large number of pages when we come back to them. Uh, now, what, what does all that stuff satisfy? What are the conditions in all of this data?
from earlier. We'll do an example this week. Just a moment. Maybe I should uh, do the, some examples. Well, let me let me do this. So. So remember, these functions CK, not only do they associate some set to each cable, huge homeomorphism of a cable gives us some, some, some isomorphism of those sets. Okay? But if uh, two of those homeomorphisms are related by an isomorphism, by an isotopy in the top dimension, we say the maps have to be identical on the matrix. And this is what That's not very good. The second thing, oh, we'll come back to that point in a second. The second thing is that the gluing maps are strictly associated. That is, if I build up some cable out of a succession of smaller cables, it doesn't matter what order I use this gluing map to assemble the big ball out of many smaller cables. Bunch of copies of this gluing map to build up like exactly the same function. Let me get away out of here. Okay. So, again, for people who've thought about higher categories before, this sounds very strange at first because you might be used to the idea that strict n categories aren't very useful and they're a wrong sort of notion to care about. And surely I'm, I'm ending up in the wrong ballpark if I'm saying. Ask for strict associativity here. So let me just show you just that, that in fact these are these are weak uh, these are weak associativities. So let's say um, let's look at uh, at C bar of the standard integer in the limit of the pure standard integer subset of the real line zero to one. Okay, uh, and let's ask: Is there a composition operation on this set? That is, is there a, is there a multiplication on this on this set that we associate? Well, no. To obtain a, to obtain a composition, uh, we need to pick uh, a reparameterization. I've been away from Australia for so long. Build reparameterization here with an S or a Z. Yes, okay. Um, I think before I left Australia, I never used the word reparameterization. <laughs> okay, we need to think of reparameterization uh, in sort of integral glue to itself end to end. Back to back to the, your favorite standard. Now, if you pick that, we get a multiplication map on uh, C1 of our favorite integral. Well, we use the gluing map to assemble a pair of morphisms into a morphism on this bigger interval. And then we use this homeomorphism of a long interval to a shorter interval to get back to the original set, to the original set that we're talking about. But of course, there's no reason here why this operation of defined needs to be associated. Just because these reparameterizations want to be uh, want to be associated. But uh, these axioms, well, including some of the axioms that I haven't actually written up, they will guarantee that that there is some two morphism uh, relating the two different ways that you compose this together, and then uh, this isotopy axiom here guarantees that even though at lower levels these operations are never are never strict at
at the top of the morph being told off no, it's not up to not up to morphism is not up to morphism. Okay. Let's uh, let's stop worrying about what exactly the display game category is and look at some examples that you can keep in mind for the rest. These functors for k strictly less than u, some ball xk. So just in this set of all maps from that ball to some fixed target space t. Okay? That's just some set associated with the ball. And then let's define at the top level a set associated from n ball to be a set of homotopy classes of maps from that n ball into t. Okay, um, and you can see that all of the rest of this data is, is very easy to provide. Okay, if I have a, a, a map from some K ball into T, I can just restrict that map from any ball in the boundary. If I have maps from two different balls into T, I can just move those maps together to a map from the ball together ball into T. And you'll see that I really needed to do something different at the top level. Take homotopy classes, not just uh, not just the, the whole set of maps, because otherwise I couldn't get this condition of uh, isotopic homeomorphisms. You needed that identity of only one map to a different isotopic map, uh, but because the class had the homotopy classes, you couldn't get this condition. Okay. Um, let me. I think I'm going to want to come back and. Uh, I'll give you some more examples in a moment, um, but keep that one in mind. It's somehow a, an easy and also surprisingly universal example. Okay. So what do you do with the display game category? Well, um, you're meant to construct topological groups. And somehow the whole point of this definition of display game categories is that it's really easy to do this construction. This is sort of the, the version of n categories uh, designed with building DFT in mind. Uh, and so unlike a lot of definitions of n categories, I can give this construction pretty straightforward. Straight away, get an n plus epsilon dimensional DFG. And in fact, I mean, I can, I will in <laughs> plus, I have no idea what n minus epsilon DFG is. Uh, and in fact, I mean, if, you, if you cared, I could tell you what extra condition you need to bootstrap all the way out of n plus one. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an extra condition on these things in order to get that extra value. Let me just tell you this one. So given This coset, we'll call D of M, coset of ball D. Which I'll show you a picture of. It's unfortunately a little hard. The, the technical, there are some yucky technical details in here. And if you want to work in the smooth category, good luck to you. I'd love to hear about how to do this in the smooth care about those sort of details, think PL, not smooth for the technical details. Okay, so what is this? Well, roughly you're just going to think that it's all the ways of taking your manifold M and chopping it up into pieces, each of which is just a ball, and such that there's a way of gluing the balls together so that you're a manifold all the way along, or all the way along. Okay? Um, I could show you that. Handle decomposition certainly counts as balls. But there are manifolds without handle decomposition that have no handle decomposition. Uh, get handle decomposition. Get handle decomposition. Roughly, you're just meant to think that the 
experiencing this process are ways of chopping a man up. And the balls and the arrows are just coursing into these balls. It's ways of assembling some collection of adjacent balls into a, into a bigger ball. And the arrows here are just saying this decomposition is very finite. Okay. Now, the uh, C gives us a function uh, from this process and set. So I need to that means I need to tell you for each picture here some set and some map for each arrow in this process. So what is it? Well, C of some decomposition of N is just a big product over um, all in the decomposition of Cn of that ball. Okay, so just all I'm saying is for each ball in this decomposition, pick an element of the set that C associates with that ball. But you don't really want to take the entire product here, you just want to take a finite product, which says that whenever any of these, any of these two balls are adjacent, you can restrict the n-morphism that you wrote here and the n-morphism you wrote here to the common interface and get the same n minus one morphism. You actually have to go all the way down and talk about restrictions all the way down the sort of the, the skeleton and, and all the way down the, the, the sort of stratification that, that, that sort of you get from here. Okay, but roughly it's you stick an n-morphism on each ball. Okay. Now what are the maps? Well, given a coarsening of a ball decomposition, I map between these sets, and of course the gluing maps, which have been erased by now, provide you with exactly that. Okay? They tell you, when you want to glue two balls together, a map taking morphisms of each of the balls and morphisms of each of the balls. So that's, the, that's this function. Now, the, uh, the set A of M, maybe I'll start from as you did this before, but I'll write now, M semicolon C, so there's a sort of A is sort of like the, a TQFT pairing that takes a manifold and an M category and spits out something. So this is now just a coolant along uh, this process D of M of this function. I can spell out exactly what that means in a second, but that's the answer. And that's what the TQFT associates to, to any N manifold. Uh, I guess I was always saying earlier that we should get vector spaces, and this is really only just a set, but you can go back and talk about categories entering into vector spaces, and you can put vector space structures in one way along. It doesn't really change anything. So don't worry about that discrepancy. So what is this covenant? Well, another way of saying this is just that this set here is just all the ways of taking, uh, you know, of course, the sort of manifold, all the ways of chopping up the manifold into balls, Labeling each ball by some n morphism in the n category. Uh, modulo the condition that, um, well, let's just say identifying refinements. So if I have some, some picture here, and another picture would get obtained from it by Plumbing a few of the balls together and gluing together the labels, I guess you call this the same thing. Okay. That, this is all that Kerlinet means. Now, at first, you might worry that this is an obscenely, uh, just a, a, an obscene description of, a, of, of producing some set or, or, or some vector space, because we've taken this giant union over all the different points in this coset, which is every different ball decomposition we're considering here in the definition. And so, the prospect of ever getting out finite dimensional vector spaces at the end of the day seems pretty unlikely, but you do in many cases. Uh, even though in the definition, it's, it's a little hard to see. A very nice thing about this definition is that it's also immediately obvious how different morphisms act. Here's some set, these pictures modulo identifying refinements that are associated to M. Now say I've got some different morphism of M. How do I get a map from this set to the to this set to itself, all I do is just move around all of these pictures by the, by the new okay? So it's 
it's, it's obviously not there. Okay, uh, let me put down an example for it. So um, the well, this is sort of just a, the examples I'm going to add here aren't really intended to help you think about good examples, but just to promise that this construction here really matches up with what everyone usually says when they talk about TLDs. So C is a uh, pivotal tensor category, whatever that is. Similarly, C is a, a modular tensor category. We can, we can think of a modular tensor category as actually being a sort of a disk like tree category. We can then inspect a space that we build for a tree map model. Is the, uh, is the range to be derived. example in other two dimensions and uh, examples in dimensions two and three. We also know an example in dimension four. Uh, there, are, there are lots of invariants in four map models, but none of them exactly fit the, the, the TFT framework. Lots of them have sort of, well, they look appealingly close to TFT, but you can't really fit one into the, into the, the mass of that system. But the one that we do know about build a disk like four category out of this thing called a Kovanov homology, which is this categorical link invariant. Um, and you can build an honest disk like four category out of it. Maybe you have to work in character to, to get over some yucky technical details, but there's a, there's a disk like four category. And so this machinery gives you well, vector spaces for four manifolds, uh, just following the nose through here. And uh, we would really, really love to be able to compute those vector spaces that Kovanov homology is telling us, and we can't. And the whole motivation for what comes next, the, the blob complex uh, version of this, is that there's some reason to think that it's, sort of, it's actually more computable uh, than, uh, than what I described earlier. Okay. So, uh, so yes. Yeah. Like, uh, like the density is just in, uh, the n plus epsilon. No oh, okay. Uh, I haven't told you how to do it, but it also gives you all the lower stuff in an almost trivial way. Um, so then we now know what the zero, the category of those things with zero manifolds that are shown in the gray. Absolutely, but remember that this funny dimension shift. So the problem is if you want to think of measure to derive the usual way, that is numbers for three manifolds, vector spaces for two manifolds, and the question you were trying to answer is what do you associate to a point, because everyone would love to know. This story tells you now, it doesn't tell you what the answer is, because the point isn't the boundary of any one. And so, I mean, in my view, this is the proof that that's the wrong question that we're trying. 
they're not additive. The point isn't the boundary of one manifold, so you shouldn't be looking for anything associated with one. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, this is awesome, so let me show you. Who cares what happens to the rest of the film? Um, <laughs> okay, so here's Kavara. Uh, I'm going to define a four manifold, so here's, here's the index k. So Kavara homology of a zero manifold is just a single set containing that zero manifold. Kavana homology of a one manifold is the singleton set containing that one manifold. Kavana homology of a two disc, sorry, I said manifold, but I meant ball, zero ball, one ball, two ball, is the set of finite subsets of that two ball. Okay? KH3, well, is a three ball. Um, what I'm going to do is tell you the set associated to a three ball with boundary decorated by, by two morphisms. Okay. This is just the set of, uh, of all embedded tangles with that specified boundary. Not a thrisotopy, no nothing, just all the embedded tangles. And KH4, so now I'm going to tell you something associated to a four ball, and again I'm going to tell you what I associate to a four ball with the boundary decorated by three morphisms. So that's decorate the boundary of a four ball locally with tangles that's the same if you want to lick on the boundary. This is just the Kravana homology vector space of that boundary. Okay? Now I claim that all the other structure is there in a nice canonical way. We can glue these vector spaces together using the fact that Kravana homology gives you maps associated to Kravana homology and Kravana homology. Now that's involved all the gluing maps. Uh, there's, a, there's a horrible subtlety about B3 versus S3 which forces you to work in characters of two. You can't do it. Integers, I guess we don't know how to do it with integers, but whatever. Um, well, this link notice really honestly lives in S3. The usual version of the Von homology derived in S3. Yeah, there's a difference. Yeah, getting over the difference of biology. But that's the whole guy. Yeah. Boy, would I love to know the invariance of, of some four manifolds that this machine reads bits up. Okay, so in order to answer exactly that question, we start thinking about the problem. Well, the block complex is actually not much different from what I've told you before. You just replace term limits with homotopy term limits. Now, this is an extremely slick way to say what the block complex is, but also completely useless to me and probably many people in the audience because what's a homotopy term limit? So let me show you a very explicit model of this homotopy code. So this is the definition we were doing two boards ago, but it shows the run. It's got some new gap. Okay. So what is this? Uh, a K chain in the block complex. So this random side down is going to be some vector, uh, some chain complex associated to any N manifold. Uh, what is it? Well, it consists of k, uh, k different balls. So we're, all, we're, we're, talk, we're working with dimension n here. Uh, confusing when k is the same index as we used for lower dimensional manifolds before. So k balls, k n dimensional balls, which I'm going to call blobs from now on to distinguish them from all the other balls in this, uh, in this story. So k blobs in the manifold M, which are pairwise nested or disjoint uh, a compatible set, that is set, uh, ball decomposition of M. So this is just saying chop M up into lots of little balls. Each of those balls should be pairwise nested or disjoint with one of the with particular blobs. That is, you can't have blobs and balls sitting across each other. Okay? Uh, uh, and a label. Of the balls. 
taking more things you see. So if you ignore this top line, this is exactly just the sort of representatives of that colon that I talked about before. It's a decomposition labeled by any names. But now we're highlighting this sort of k different blobs in that diagram and, and keeping track of them. So that's what the the, the, the key chains in this chain complex are. What are the, what's the differential on this chain complex? Well, it better be some way of removing one of the blobs, because we've got to get down to k minus one blobs. Well, the differential is a sum, a sign sum, over two different things you could do. One is just ways to forget a blob. Keep all the data, leave out one of the blobs. Or ways to forget an innermost blob. So remember that blobs are pairwise nested or disjoint, and an innermost blob is just one that has no further blobs inside it. Forget an innermost blob and blue up its content. Color here. So here's a there's some two blob diagram. Okay, we've chopped it up into lots of small balls. They were by endomorphisms, and we've highlighted two blobs. The blob. Notice the blobs can be much bigger than the balls. In the ball. This one contains two. This one contains three. Okay. So what are the terms over here? Well, there are going to be three terms. First one, we just forget this outermost blob. So we just leave all the labels the same. Z U V. We just keep this uh, this blob. There we are. In the next term, we uh, we forget the inner blob. Finally, the last term, this blob here was an innermost one, so we have to forget that, but at the same time as we forget it, we blew up its contents. And so that means we replace all of the balls inside that blob with a the, with the bigger ball, filling up the whole blob, and we blew together all the labels inside. Okay? So that's the difference. Now, what you need to think about at the moment is that H0 of this complex really is exactly the co-limit that I told you about before. So what's, what's H0? Maybe let me just ransack. I should, well, okay. Let's just think about the case where there's just a single blob. Okay, it's certainly innermost because there's only one of them. There are two terms in the differential. What are the two terms? It's just the diagram without any blobs in the rear or the same diagram with some collection of the, the balls formed together and they label the inner. And that difference now is a, is a boundary in this chain complex. So H0 is just all of these diagrams, modulo those ones, and that's the curve that goes on top. But there's all of this, there's maybe all this higher stuff too. Okay. Where do I need to stop very soon? 25. Okay. I think I have time to say two things. Okay. So we uh, we've defined some gadget, which is a chain complex three k manifold, and the zero homology of that chain complex was the uh, was the the, the TQFT invariant that we've known about before. So what good are all the higher parts in this chain complex? Well, first of all, it's like easy to see from this definition that if your n manifold is just an n ball. That is, it's got no topology at all. Uh, then there's no higher stuff in this chain complex. It's all just H zero, and and that really that, that almost pins down uh, the definition. This is just sort of a unique way to do something that's sort of 
doesn't care about what the manifold is, that it works in all manifolds, gives you the right answer for each zero, and doesn't introduce any higher stuff when you work in manifolds. That actually almost pins down this construction. Uh, so somehow any higher homology in this chain complex really is some interaction between the, the topology of the manifold and the, and the, the energy. Okay. So let me tell you two things about this uh, block complex. So the first one is that families of different morphisms are Remember, normal TFT gives you morphism, it gives you a linear map, it gives you the, uh, the vector spaces, but now we get something much richer. Because there are chain maps from singular chains, which is just the singular chain C, not the category C, of different morphisms of our manifold N. Take to the block complex. M coefficients in C through the block complex. Okay. Now, um, what do I need to say about this? Um, on A0, this is just the old action of different morphisms. Notice that it, you see right away that isotopic different morphisms act identically on each zero because isotopic different morphisms are, are, are connected in you know, a homotopic to each other in this chain complex. Uh, okay, so, so on each zero, it's just what you knew about before, uh, and it's compatible. Gluing, uh, and in fact, this map is uh, is indeed determined by. Zero, we knew that this is just the old action of different morphisms. But say you've got some one parameter family of different morphisms of your manifold. Okay? Well, you can, you can fix that here and think of that as giving you a degree one operator on the blob complex that lifts you up uh, from k chains to k plus one chains. Uh, so, a very nice example of this in action is that you can actually show that in dimension one, so say you're just looking at one category, and your manifold is S1. This, the blob complex there is quasi isomorphic to the Hochschild complex. Uh, and rotation around the circle, that's some one parameter family of different morphisms of S1, uh, gives the, the simple differential. Which is kind of cool. Nice geometric way of thinking about that. Uh, another thing you could do is uh, say uh, look at the rotation along a rational slope on, uh, on the two torus. That gives you a map from uh, the blob complex on the two torus of some two category. The block complex one degree higher up. So there's this action of the mapping class group of the block torus on the zero homologies, well, on, on in fact all of the homologies, but that's somehow compatible with a whole bunch of these maps that tell you degree one raising uh, operators associated with the rational slope. Maybe that's something fun to go into. Who knows? Okay. Um, let me say one final thing about why we wanted to do this. Get back to Gravano homology for a second. The really cool thing is that the blob complex uh, often, uh, well, let's just say, reflects triangulated structures in the original N category, which often the teacher of T complete classes. So here's, here's the thing to think about. So, uh, 
So in Travada homology, there's an exact triangle. Related to that. In Travada homologies, In the boundary of, of B4. Uh, so, what is this? Well, you can take the Kravana homology of some link in the boundary of B4, and you can actually compute that Kravana homology by looking at the Kravana homology of two resolutions of some crossing. This is a favorite crossing of two different resolutions. And it turns out Kravana homology gives you a vector space here, a vector space here, or chain complex here. Chain complex here and a, and a chain map between them. And this chain map here is, is the cone of, of that map. Okay? And this is in practice how you compute Kravana homology of links. Now, this exact triangle is only works sort of in V4. If you try and think about uh, links in the boundary of other four manifolds using the, the, the TFT prescription, this exact triangle just fails, essentially because co limits don't preserve an exact. But uh, the, the blob complex does, and it's not exact. Well, I'd have to draw a kind of complicated picture. Maybe I won't try and draw it right here. Um, but essentially, when you look at the blob complex version of, uh, of the four manifold invariant in Kravana homology, you, you do have some structure coming from this exact triangle. It ends up being a little complicated. Spectral sequence converging to zero, the diversification of which, yada yada yada. But in principle, it, it might give you ways of computing the entire blob complex Kravano invariant of a four manifold. Uh, and that might be the, the best way just to compute the H0 bit, which is that, that TGOT invariant of the four manifold that you were hoping to, to get in the first place. But this sort of thing, the fact that, that exact triangles in the original N category end up being reflected in the blob complex version where they, where they vanish in the original TFT invariant. That's sort of the reason why we started thinking about this all in the first place. So yeah. Thank So, Kravana homology is very unfortunately defined in terms of, of not diagrams and randomized moves and all, and all of that kind of material mess. Um, but you can extract from that uh, once you know that it's functorial, that is, it associates maps to quick organisms, uh, you can actually do better. And you can actually say there is a vector space, a particular vector space associated to each embedded link, not up to isotopy. It's not a price to the vector space is up price and honest vector space and honesty, and then honest dicemorphism to the vector space and the isomorphism to the vector space. And it's important to think sort of with that version of the price in mind. In this sort of giving you what you Yeah, yeah. You definitely need to move in that way about your own homology in that sense. Yeah. Where the jewels are in this? Yeah, yeah, because it's really in the TFT, you've got a clearly where they are, you've got a link category between some of them, then you might find them. Well, so the, I think the, the way to see where the jewels are in this picture is just that um, we meant to have a functor from group K and K balls into sets. And in particular, there's a homeomorphism of a, of a K ball, that, I mean, the rotations of the K ball are all homeomorphic. They don't fix the boundary, but they, 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 they still have maps associated with this. So if you pick some element of a, of 
the k-morphism is the shape x, if there's an operation corresponding to turning the ball upside down and in, in many different ways depending on the dimension k, and those are all the duality operations in that sense. So it's those rotations of the ball that you can do. And I think, I mean, if you're sort of asking about duality slightly, maybe you were thinking about duality yeah, no, slightly different way, but I think, I think that that's the Well, I mean, the, the, the triangulated category is, is just um, is just sort of chain complexes uh, and, and on. Oh, um, so where did it do? Um, oh, yeah, the, 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 there's a shift along. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the shift is on this average. And Kravana homology gives you not just a vector space for the whole chain complex. This is not a big deal. You can have any other SG 